G'day everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Uh, I wanna thank you all for joining us and I would like to begin today by acknowledging that I live and work on the land of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was obviously never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The Australia Institute does do these webinars at least weekly, but days and times do vary as long time watchers will know. So make sure you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au uh, to find out all the details for upcoming webinars. Just a few tips before we begin today to make sure that things run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panel. You should be able to upvote questions from other people and also comment on their questions. A reminder, if you can, to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this is being recorded and we'll put up a recording of it on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel um, later on. And you should also be able to find it on our website as well. So this webinar is part of an ongoing series that we're doing with Australian Foreign Affairs, which is the country's leading foreign affairs journal. Here's what this issue looks like. You should run out and grab yourself a copy. But until midnight tonight, Australia Institute supporters have access to a special discount. Um, I think Kate is going to post um, a link to that in the chat. If you haven't bought your copy yet, I really urge you to do so. It's a great read. Um, it's the 13th issue of Australian Foreign Affairs, and this one examines the future of India. It's a rising giant whose unsteady growth and unpredictable political turns raise questions about its role and power in Asia. It explores the challenge for Australia as it seeks to improve its faltering ties with the world's largest democracy, a nation whose ascent, if achieved, could reshape the regional order. And today I'm delighted to introduce Adi Bedagheri, who is a multi-platform journalist and former foreign correspondent based in Canberra. She's a correspondent for Monocle, a columnist for the Lowy Institute's The Interpreter, and she contributes to various other local and foreign media outlets. And her essay explores the fast growing Indian Australian community and its potential to reshape Australia's ties to India. And Professor Michael Wesley is Deputy Vice Chancellor at the International, uh, sorry, Deputy Vice Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne. He has extensive experience in international strategy and relations and has worked in higher education, government and the private sector and has published a lot on foreign policy. And his essay uh, begins the journal and it interrogates the future for India and Australia and looks at some of the likely challenges, opportunities and threats facing the two nations. And last but not least, we've got Alan Bean, who's the director of the Australia Institute's International and Security Affairs Program. Alan has extensive experience in international policy, national security policy and defence policy. And prior to coming to the Institute, he was Penny Wong's senior foreign policy advisor. Thank you for joining us, Michael, Adi and Alan. Thanks so much. Michael, if I can begin with you, your essay, as I said, really begins this issue um, and you go into the history of Australia's relationship with India and the many ways in which we've kind of never quite aligned happily. Um, what do people need to understand about the Australia-India relationship, do you think? Well, uh, thanks very much, Ebony, and, and terrific to be, to be joining you and such distinguished panellists. Um, I think, as I say in the essay, the Australia-India relationship with, was born troubled. Um, it was troubled by uh, different attitudes towards race. It was uh, troubled by different um, uh, policies towards international relations. India adopted a, a very strongly Nehruvian foreign policy in the early years, which, uh, which rejected any notion of power politics of course, India was a leader of the non-aligned movement, whereas Australia was a very steadfast ally of the United States uh, and uh, a very um, paid up member of the Western Alliance during the Cold War. So um, for much of uh, the history of independent India since 1947, Australia and India have looked at each other and the world in very, very different ways. Um, and there have been really significant uh, legacies to deal with. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, what we've seen really uh, develop over the last 
decade or so in terms of uh, the growing uh, closeness of our relationship uh, has been remarkable given um, how estranged the two countries were for most of uh, the 20th century. Mm. Um, we'll come back to dive into a few more details uh, of your essay, but Artie, I want to come to you next. Um, you've obviously focused on the Indian diaspora, um, even touching on in some places the experiences of your own family. Um, and I was really struck by your observation of um, how fragmented that community can be here in Australia. I wonder if you could just expand on, on that for people who perhaps um, haven't read the journal yet. Sure, and thanks very much for having me, Ebony. Um, so I always describe India as not one country, not one entity, but Europe. And I think of it as the EU. It's a, it, it's a loose collection of independent states, each with their own separate culture and history and language, a lot of cases, cuisine, um, social norms, social dynamics. So to kind of, when, when you think collectively about India, it's actually a collection of independent individual states and cultures, not just one united entity. And it always was like that. You know, it, its history um, was as princely states, you know, pre-British Raj times. So that's carried over to Australia. So back when my parents came out 50 years ago, there weren't that many Indian um, migrants. So they did band together. Now there's like I think the last count, there's a, there's a few hundred thousand in Australia, I think 700,000 Indian people with Indian heritage. So there's more likely to be people from your linguistic group, from your cultural group, from your religion, from your subgroup, um, from the city you came from. So people are just more likely to kind of silo off and hang out with just those people, which is great for them, as I point out in my article, but not so great for the community as a whole. Like there's not one unified voice. There's not one individual um, spokesperson for the community. There's not one um, kind of collective ability to uh, project a voice into the, into the Australian community. And very, very vitally, there's no real um, potential for there to be any political power or political presence because there is that fundamental lack of unity. Yeah, I want to come back to that uh, political presence a bit later, but um, I can just see a few people in the chat posting questions. Just a reminder, if you can pop those in the Q&A box, that would be most appreciated so I can find them easily later. Sometimes they get lost in the chat. I can see we've got 300 people on the line with us, so thanks so much for joining us. Um, Michael, I want to come back to you next. Um, you wrote in here that Australia, it's not clear that India is prepared to, um, to play the function that Australia may want it to in terms of the relationship. I wondered if you could tell us what role is that that you think Australia has in mind for India and why might India not be prepared to play it? Yeah, look, I think uh, the first place to start is that Australia has a unique history with, with great powers. Uh, we've been heavily dependent on great powers for uh, really since uh, European settlement in Australia, first the British and then the Americans. Um, we expect uh, great powers uh, to uh, look after us. Uh, we rely on them for a sense of existential security. And we tend to see the world through their, through their eyes. It means that a country with the, uh, you know, uh, with the, the size and, uh, or the lack of size and the lack of resources of Australia tends to see the world as a great power would see it. We, we become obsessed by things that happen around the world and we expect to have a voice that uh, some, some would say is, is outsized for uh, our actual uh, significance on the world stage. Um, and and I, I think that uh, Australia tends to look at other great powers uh, when they're not Britain or the United States and judge them according to how much uh, they can help us, how much they can provide a sense of security for us, and, uh, and, and whether we can start to identify with how they see the world. I said, I, I, my, my sense is that India uh, will not play that role for Australia. Um, it is uh, very much a country uh, that values its strategic autonomy. Uh, it very much uh, uh, sees the world through its immediate 
uh, geographic environs. Uh, it is confronted by uh, really uh, two hostile neighbours uh, that are aligned with each other. As I say in the essay, it's a similar situation to that which Germany faced uh, for most of the 20th century, where um, it, it faced the possibility of a two front war uh, against uh, combined adversaries and India uh, will remain obsessed by that. So I think that uh, in that sense, India won't be the sort of great power that Australia uh, expects. Um, and the other, the other point I would make is a, is a slightly more theoretical point, and that is the rise of India um, and uh, the United States-India relationship uh, really is the harbinger of the development of a multipolar region. Uh, a region that is not dominated by one power. So it's not dominated by the United States, it's not dominated by China, but it is a, a region which is uh, balanced among a number of great powers. Um, that is certainly uh, the, the wishes of much of Southeast Asia. And, uh, but that is not a region that is familiar to Australia. We've become familiar with a region that is dominated by one power or another. Mm. And once again, that will require us to rethink the way that we look at the world and how we practice our statecraft. Yeah. Alan, I wonder if you wanted to respond to that. Well, I mean, how can you respond to that? It's absolutely correct. Michael sort of summed it all up just, just perfectly, I think. The, the issue for Australia always is that we're looking for a great protector. We're not really looking for partners. And as we look out for great protectors, we rarely understand the nature of the, the protector, I mean, what character the protector has, and we rarely understand what the protector is looking for itself. I mean, it's high time that Australia looked at its international relations much more in terms of how it forges partnerships than at how it creates protective arrangements. And Michael is completely correct that, that India has no interest whatsoever in extending any kind of protective umbrella to anybody else. Um, and this is the point that Artie made at the very, very beginning. I mean, India is not a monolith. I mean, it's easy for us to look at it and say, oh, well, it's got a flag and it's got a capital city and it's got a prime minister. And my word, doesn't it ever share values with us? But the fact of the matter is it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't share values with us. What it shares with us is a very deep seated uh, wish to manage its own future and to manage the future of its citizens but its citizens, a bit different from ours, represent a whole set of different cultural dynamics. So that India in many respects for over 2000 years has been a, a sort of a, trend, a centrifugal society with all the bits pushing away from each other, not actually coming together. And if we don't understand that, if we don't understand the dynamics of India, then we can't possibly have it as a protector. And even to have India as a partner requires us to be much more sensitive to the nature of India itself. And uh, that I think is a, is a journey that Australia has got to embark upon uh, urgently I do also note in Michael's essay that like everybody else who writes about India, he ends his, his title with a question mark. <laughs> and, and we all do that um, because we're dealing with something that we don't fully understand. And unless you understand it, honestly, you can't make much in the way of headway. So I don't want to gabble on about this, but Michael's made some very, very profound points and I'm 150% in agreement with what he said. Um, Artie, I think um, the way you just described it earlier that we need to think of India more as Europe, um, that's definitely going to stick with me as a useful way of uh, understanding it better. But I wanted to come back to... Um, the real precarity that I think shone through when you were describing um, the experiences of, in particular, I think, um, Indian students who are studying here in Australia and the profound impact that the pandemic has had on them and their precarity here as well. Um, and you talked a lot about the, the real chain of exploitation, it seems to me, um, from the pipeline of Indian students into skilled migrant visas and, and all those kinds of things. I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about that experience and what it's been like um, for students, because it really did strike me um, that just the precarity that you described. Mm. 
Yeah, it is a really precarious um, existence for a lot of them. Now, I think that there's the best starting point is to kind of understand that Indians use um, studying as a pathway to migrate to Australia. So it's different for different communities. For example, Chinese students usually study here and then go back. But Indians really do use it as their way to, to actually eventually migrate here, settle permanently. I mean, it's, and that kind of cuts across all education levels. I'm, I'm studying at ANU, um, I'm doing a master's at the moment. And one of my um, co-students last year, she has a doctorate from Harvard, but decided she wanted to migrate to Australia. And her pathway was, again, to do yet another master's degree at ANU. So um, usually uh, Indians already have qualifications. They decide to come here. Their parents see it as an investment in the collective future of their family. So they sell land or, uh, you know, withdraw all their savings to pay for the education or they borrow money from their family and their community. Then the students are here. They've paid all this money to get an education, they come here and they do low skilled or semi-skilled work, you know, petrol stations, they drive Ubers, they work in construction sites. Um, and often they don't know their rights. And that is something that really works to benefit business owners as we have, as has been proved, you know, with the whole 7-Eleven scandal. Um, then they finish their education, they have to do internships, three to six months of unpaid work. That means they have to leave their work or they have to work reduced hours. So again, they, they're kind of being exploited for their labor because often their um, previous qualifications from India aren't properly recognized here. Only all work experience isn't recognized, only local experience counts. And then, as I say in the essay, they emerge, they're fully trained, fully educated, they've got an Australian education, they join Australia's workforce, and really the whole point of attracting so many migrants from India is to grow Australia's economy. You know, that's the whole point of our extremely high migration intake. Um, so at every point, Australia wins. You know, they get the fees, they get the, the cheap labour, they get the free internships, and then they get the labour. Yeah, it was, um, I think, to knowing how much the government really just left, in particular, foreign students and not just Indian ones, completely out to dry um, during the pandemic when there was lots of income support offered um, for a lot of other Australians, although universities were amongst those excluded as well. Um, it really did just um, strike me how much in common that has with the overall um, insecurity of work that we've seen be a driver of the pandemic, um, the young people being excluded from housing, and then they've got that extra layer over the top of precariousness of not having secure visas or secure permanent residency, those types of things. Um, I really do urge people, if you can, to go and grab a copy. The essays are, are really wonderful. Um, Michael, I want to come back to uh, the point that you were making about the multipolar regional order, um, as opposed to, I think you described as the heliocentrism of Australian foreign policy. Um, and going back to, as you said, India's um, uh, non-alignment policy, if you could just describe, um, I guess, how that history um, of India of non-alignment um, influences the way that it operates in the world now and understands its power as we kind of move away from having, you know, one major power, as you were describing. Yeah, sure. Look, um, India has, um, has had a, a really interesting strategic history, to be honest. Um, it has played a, a very kind of idealistic and, uh, you know, uh, role in terms of uh, being a leader in the non-aligned movement. But in other ways, India uh, does look like other great powers. So if you go all the way back to Nehru, uh, India sees the Indian Ocean as a particular strategic zone that it does not want hostile uh, interests lodging in. Um, in many ways, it's very similar to the Monroe Doctrine that was adopted by, um, by the United States in the 19th century. And in many ways, it's very similar to the way that Australia has uh, uh, usually seen the South Pacific and arguably still does see the South Pacific. And so um, there's, uh, there's a, almost a schizophrenia to the way that India has used its power. Uh, in one sense, it, is, uh, it has eschewed the use of power and, uh, 
and denounce the use of, uh, of power by other great powers, but in another way, it sees itself as um, the, the protector of South Asia and uh, the, the, the kind of warden of, of, this, of the Indian Ocean. Uh, we've seen it uh, willing to intervene in its, in its neighbours. Uh, it intervened in Bangladesh in 1971. It intervened in Sri Lanka. Um, it's intervened in the Maldives, uh, often at the, um, uh, uh, sometimes at the invitation of these countries, but it does see itself as playing this protective role in South Asia and, uh, and, and more broadly in the Indian Ocean. And I guess the point that I make in the essay is that the, the real strategic interest that brings Aust Australia and India together is their shared interest in the Indian Ocean and their shared interest in uh, maintaining stability uh, in the Indian Ocean and their shared concern about China's growing role in the Indian Ocean. I think that is going to be the central dynamic that drives India and Australia closer together. Um, Alan, would you agree with that? Yes, I do. Uh, I think that uh, India, uh, as we were saying a bit earlier, India starts from itself and its own interests, of course. It is quite an introspective country in many respects, again, because of the internal uh, pressures that, that characterise India very much. So as it looks around its neighbourhood, it is looking at its neighbourhood as extensions very often of its own long cultural history. Uh, it's not an interventionist power. I mean, one of the, the odd things in my life was to go to the, the Commonwealth War Cemetery at Yokohama to find that there are a whole lot of Indians who were buried there. And as I looked at that, I thought, what on earth were these guys doing here? Uh, it, it's just not that kind of country. So India is not an interventionist power. Um, it's, it's very much a power which is about sustaining its own identity and its own position. So for Australia, we have some very deep common interest over the Indian Ocean, all right. But with India, we also share some pretty important interest in the stability of Southeast Asia. And um, uh, Artie's point at the very beginning about the nature of the, the diaspora in Australia, we have a diaspora of diasporas actually in Australia, because many of the people in our Indian community actually don't come from India. They come from Fiji or they come from Malaysia. Uh, they come from the United States or Canada or Britain um, or anywhere, uh, South Africa. So we've got to understand that the Indian diaspora as it now comes back into Australia is an extremely leavening diaspora. It's, it's a fabulous group of people, but they bring with them their own cultural histories. And for that reason, you can't look at the Indian diaspora as being India. What you have to look at the Indian diaspora as being is a new generation of Australians that are going to build our society to be a very different sort of society from the Anglo society that we like to imitate. Mm. Um, can, I just, can I just jump in there, Ebony? It, yeah. In many ways, um, Australia is becoming more like Southeast Asian countries like Singapore and Malaysia, where which, which obviously have large Chinese and large Indian diasporas living there. Um, and that trend is going to continue. That is what the demographic trend uh, is taking us towards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, Ebony, that is a big strategic issue for Australia. I mean, we, we don't leverage that nearly enough, which is the point of the question mark at the end of Michael's title. <laughs> And I think it's very much the point that arty has been making about the nature of the diaspora in, in Australia, that we don't understand what a fabulous asset we've got in the same way as we don't understand what a fabulous asset we've got with our Chinese and Vietnamese communities in Australia. You know, yeah. we're blind to our natural strength. Yeah, Artie, I wanted to come back to you um, and in particular that question um, that you referenced in your essay, where are the Indian Australian politicians? Um, I think if you look at other Anglo countries um, and certainly other Commonwealth countries, um, but even if we just go back to the motherland in the United Kingdom or in the USA, we can see uh, Indian politicians at the highest levels of government, but not really so much in Australia. 
Absolutely. And I actually just want to quickly touch on Alan's point before about um, all the soldiers' headstones in Yokohama. It's the same thing in Gallipoli. I know. Gallipoli is full of Indian names, and that's something that's just not really touched on. There's recently, um, in the last few years, an Indian journalist wrote a book about um, World War I involvement by Indian soldiers, which I will look up and put into the chat if anyone's interested. But um, just to speak to Ebony's question about political participation, you would think that, you know, with the history of Indian or subcontinental settlement in Australia and with the numbers, that we should have representation um, there are none at the federal level. There's Dave Sharma, but I don't. I think he very much distances distances himself from his Indian heritage. I don't think he speaks for the community or about the community. Lisa Singh certainly did, but as we know, she's no longer there. There are um, there is some at state level. Um, there is a New South Wales MP who's from Wulgulga, whose family's been here for a few generations. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. Um, but really, there is not. Re there is not representation that reflects the the size and the makeup of the community. And I was listening to um, the Australia Indian Institute's chat um, with John McCarthy last week, and he did say, look, that's going to come. You know, as the community grows, political representation will happen. I don't think it'll just happen. I think it needs to be courted. Um, and that comes down to systemic issues, but also cultural issues. You know, the systemic ones are that there is no pipeline, like Indians are not being targeted and trained and pushed into prominent roles and made part of political parties' um, plans for the future. And cultural, um, it's just not what we as a community do. I'm second generation. I would say all of my Indian friends who I grew up with are doctors, lawyers, engineers, or small business. You know, it's all about financial stability for Indians. Um, our parents came here, they came from pretty precarious financial circumstances in India. You know, I'm talking about pre liberalization 1991, when it was basically a Soviet style kind of economic um, framework in India. So everyone is just poor. They leave India, they come to Australia or elsewhere, they're looking for financial security and stability. And they're the values that were instilled in us not to be public faces, like me being a journalist, that was like way out there for my generation. No one else did it. Um, it was just not, you know, something that anyone could relate to at all. But, you know, my parents came out in the era of doctors. So it was really that pattern, that wave of migration was all about the very highly skilled um, Indians. Now, of course, it's diluted a bit, but I just can't see, we're, we're not raised being told you can be a politician or you should be a politician. It's not seen as being financially secure or just even very relevant to what we want to achieve as a community. Mm, um, and before we go to questions from the audience, which I'll get to very soon, I can see a number of questions um, piling up there. Um, Adi, I did want to ask you in particular, you've highlighted um, as an upside to the crisis, the visibility of the Sikh community and um, the volunteerism that they've exhibited through the bushfires and the pandemic delivering meals and things like that. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. I think uh, now the, the Sikh community in Australia is really on the map. And I think what's important to point out about that is that they've used their own culture to gain acceptability and credibility in Australia. You know, that, I, that notion of service, it's kind of embedded into the Sikh religion. It's called seva. Um, so Sikhs who are very um, pious and religious, they're looking for ways that they can you know, serve their communities. So with the bushfires, they literally just rolled up to towns, were like, do you guys want some free food? They set up their tables and they gave out food. And that's how they did it. It was not structured or organised. And um, I think now Sikhs are real, in Australia are really synonymous with their efforts during the pandemic and during the bushfires, and I'm sure that that will continue. Mm, absolutely. Um, all right, we might go to questions from the audience now. I can see we've got uh, just over 330 people on the line. If you've got a question, you can type it into the Q&A function uh, that we've got there. There should be a little box where you can type your question in. Uh, the first question I've got from Tony Miller is he says that... Um, 
that he has heard that India will overtake other countries as the major manufacturer of the world. Um, do you agree that uh, that's the future for India and do you think that's a positive or a negative? Michael, I wonder if I might ask you to reflect on that one. Uh, well, let me start by saying I'm not, a, I'm not an economist, Tony, um, but uh, I think that uh, there's a possibility there, but there are also um, some major um, hurdles uh, to get over to, for India to get to that particular place. China became uh, the world's manufacturing, the largest uh, manufacturing country in the world, mainly through foreign investment. Um, uh, American firms, Japanese firms, Korean firms, European firms that saw um, two things in China that they uh, really wanted to uh, benefit from. One was low wages, and the other one was a government that was uh, prepared to bend over backwards to welcome in uh, foreign capital uh, and, uh, and foreign industry. India certainly has the first, uh, but I doubt it has the second. Um, uh, the Indian government, uh, although it's not um, as uh, determined uh, to be uh, you know, self-sufficient as it was uh, for the first, uh, let's say, 40 years of India's independence, um, it is still very loath uh, to uh, drastically liberalise uh, India's foreign investment uh, laws. We've seen uh, some manufacturing firms set up in India. The Koreans uh, are, are quite forward-leaning in that sense. The Japanese uh, are starting to do that. Some American firms, some European firms, but I think by and large, India is, is still seen as a difficult country to invest in. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that spectacular rise of manufacturing uh, that you saw in China between uh, the uh, late 1980s uh, and the, the late 2000s uh, probably won't be replicated in India. It may be a slower burn uh, path towards um, uh, manufacturing significance, but uh, it certainly won't be a Chinese tra trajectory. That would be my, my view. Hmm. Um, the next question is from David Valance, and this might be one for you in the first instance, Alan. Uh, he says, despite the recent surge in discussion about the Quad, the fact remains that India will be hard pressed to project any significant naval power into the Pacific and trying to find it difficult uh, into the Indian Ocean, notwithstanding other things. So while we certainly do share interest in the Indian Ocean, how reasonably can we expect that a future India would consider our middling power concerns in the archipelago and Southwest Pacific as overlapping with its own interests as a major or great power? Alan, I'll start with you on that one. It, it's a pretty major question, and uh, I reckon all of us could talk about this for the rest of the day. It is a very big issue, actually. Uh, what we're looking at at the moment with the Quad, I think, is four partners that have got absolutely different objectives, um, that we don't share objectives in the Quad. What we have in the Quad is uh, quite singular and, in my opinion, divergent objectives. And it, it is what worries me, actually, about the current nature of the Quad, with its, um, I think, overweening emphasis on defence and security matters, without thinking about what are the real strategic underpinnings that will support long-term uh, strategic stability in Asia, where we all where we all live, and where the United States retains interests, and that is not resolved. Um, it's a case of four different four different uh, people in a, in a, a single bed, all dreaming different dreams. Um, and I think that until we broaden the base of the Quad to think about how it relates to what's going on in Southeast Asia, in particular, and and um, obviously the ASEAN countries, uh, what's really happening in North Asia with China, uh, where the Chinese uh, and, and Japan relationship is going, then the Quad will just be uh, a funny sort of discussion group sitting on the margins of things. And um, I, I don't know that that's really where any of the four partners want to be. Um, and while I remain largely focused on China as some kind of putative enemy, I don't think it'll go any further. 
um, it, it's really got to flip that over completely and look at the region as a, as a large enterprise in the same way as the Europeans have managed to do since the Second World War. Now, even in Europe, it's not entirely successful. Uh, Britain's had a walk away. So that creating something like that in Asia, where we've got a few of the tools like APEC and maybe a bit of the G20, certainly the ASEAN uh, structures, until we are able to relate those to the Quad, I think the Quad is simply just another little talk shop that might serve some utility in broadening Australia's interest and, and access to the world, but doing very little for any of the other three partners. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? Look, I agree with that. The, the, the other thing I would say, Alan, is that I worry that the Quad is actually distancing us from Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, South, Southeast Asia in, in general, I think a lot of the ASEAN, the leading countries in ASEAN worry that the Quad is, is taking initiative and stability away from, from ASEAN itself, something that is of paramount importance to Southeast Asian countries. And so in many ways, while the Quad makes, um, makes sense at one level, it doesn't make sense at another level. Um, Australia... Uh, its future, our, our safety, our prosperity uh, must be forged in partnership with countries uh, around us, uh, particularly to our immediate north. And uh, I would give a shout out to James Curran's excellent essay in, uh, in this edition of Australian Foreign Affairs. Um, and we need to be very uh, aware that, uh, that if we allow the Quad to dominate our foreign policy making, and our strategic policy making, then we will be putting a major wedge between ourselves and Southeast Asia. Mm. Uh, this next one is for you, Artie. It's from uh, Nishad, who asks, why is it that we don't understand and engage our Indian diaspora as an asset to the extent that we should? And what's preventing uh, a more wholesome engagement or fulsome, I guess? I think I come back to Alan's point about the question mark at the end of every headline about India, I think Australia just doesn't get it, just doesn't, simply doesn't understand um, India. And I think that's from every sphere. You know, I've worked in newsrooms in uh, the ABC and SBS, and I can tell you there's not a lot of India literacy going on there. Um, you know, I just, I, I listen to what people say about India and it's all very reductive. It's all oh, cricket and curry and, you know, it, it's, that there's not a lot of understanding of what India is all about. And I think that of course is gonna carry through to the diaspora. Um, I also think that, um, you know, when you're a migrant to another country, you're forced to kind of take your home culture and stuff it into a box and just pull out the bits that are easily comprehensible or explainable to a wider population. So that's what Indians here are forced to do. Like, colourful weddings and Diwali and loud Punjabi music, that's only kind of representative of one very small corner of India. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't reflect what's going on elsewhere. Um, I think one side uh, effect of the growth of the, the diaspora is the importation of political conflict or um, identity conflict from um, India. So earlier this year, there was an attack by Hindu nationalists on Sikhs, on a carload of Sikhs in Harris Park in Western Sydney. Um, I just read the other day that one of the main instigators of that was um, deported back to India, but he received a hero's welcome in India. You know, that didn't get very much coverage. Um, so I think as the diaspora grows and as the the relationship grows. I think Australians now are very, very cognizant of the fact that Australia's future is, you know, very intertwined with that of India's through the Quad and through our kind of shared issues with China. Um, I think that literacy in the, the wider public is growing, but it'll take more and it'll take, it'll take people who are prominent and willing to speak out. Mm. Um, the next question I might put to the whole panel, uh, it's from Wendy Tubman, and she asks, how serious is India about tackling climate change, especially in light of the relationship between Adani and Modi? I guess that's a question about Adani here as well. Um, who would like to take a first crack at climate change? Artie? <laughs> I can. I lived in India for nearly nine years um, recently. It's not serious at all about tackling climate change. 
you know, I've breathed that polluted Delhi air. It is unbelievable. It is so thick and heavy, you can show it. You can't live a normal life in Delhi. All of my friends are now leaving Delhi. Um, when the Modi government came in, one of the first things they did was to water down environmental regulations to make it easier for corporates who wanted to, um, a, a less regulated environment to work in. There is one saving grace. India has a green court, an environmental court that operates kind of like our family court does. Um, where it specifically was set up to hear and tackle um, environmental cases. So, yeah, it's heard some Adani issues. Yeah, certainly uh, a few to, to work out there. Um, Alan, I know you've got an extensive background in, in climate change. Um, Artie was touching on the issues of pollution in Delhi there. We've certainly seen similar issues um, in Chinese uh, cities drive reforms to reduce emissions there. What are your hopes on India and climate change? Look, the position of India as the leader of the, the sort of developing country group in the conference of the parties is um, a, a very ambiguous one. Um, what, what most of the developing countries uh, say, and there's some justification for their claims, is that the West has become rich on the base on the back of really serious uh, environmental pollution and global warming, and here's the West now posturing to uh, change the rules uh, at a, in a way that will disadvantage countries that are seeking to develop their economies. So the extent to which um, you have a, a prime minister like Morrison and a prime minister like Modi, um, who are both past masters at at whipping up the spin but not delivering the policy that will support movement on climate change really means that nothing much will happen until in India, as in China and Australia, we all actually legislate to, to bring targets into play and then have sanctions for those who don't meet them. And until we do that, we don't have a rules-based international order underpinning climate change. There are no rules. There are simply statements of intent. And uh, India makes noble statements of intent. India is very good at making noble statements of intent. Uh, we we uh, are sort of second graders uh, in, in that particular yeah. game. But I think until there is some real substance internationally, uh, India will continue to develop its, uh, its economy on the back of hydrocarbons. And uh, that is something that's not in India's interests, but it will remain so, uh, I think, until the tipping point is reached. And then there is, or necessarily, uh, concerted global action with sanctions. Michael, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Look, I, I, I agree with, with Ari and Alan, but let me add a, a note of optimism here that uh, one of the wonderful things about India is its deeply ingrained culture of social activism. This, of course, goes all the way back to Gandhi and the independence struggle. And uh, some of the most articulate uh, and fabulous environmental activists in the world are in India. And, uh, and they have the ability to make things very, very uncomfortable for the government. So uh, while I agree in general, um, I do think that there are grounds for optimism as well. Yeah, and certainly Australia is in a glass house when it comes to any throwing any stones on climate policy. Um, the next question is from Leon Zembekis, who uh, asks, what reparations should India receive from Australia and England from the 400 years of theft committed by the East India Company, whose strongmen ended up in Australia uh, for colonial rule and killing black people here? I wonder who would like to touch on the legacy of the East India Company? Oh dear, um, <laughs> the Parthenon marbles <laughs> come to immediately to mind. Um, I don't call them after the, the, the pier, I call them after where they came from. Look, this is a huge question and I don't think it's actually framed in a way that uh, allows an answer. Uh, the history is there. Uh, the first thing that has to happen, I think, is the history has got to be accepted. And uh, in prepping for this discussion this morning, um, I got out William Dalrymple's fabulous, fabulous book, The Anarchy, uh, last night. And I mean, I, it, it is a, a most important book. And I hope everybody watching this program today actually reads it, because it helps you understand something about contemporary India, 
you know, what happened to India was extraordinary. Um, it, it was essentially robbed and raped. Uh, and that for a very long period of time. And, and it reverberates now. Many of India's current attitudes towards capitalism are deeply cultural because of the experience that it had over a couple of hundred years under a, a, a group of, of thieves, essentially, corporate thieves. And the purpose of Dalrymple's book actually is to warn us about the modern form of corporate theft, not just about the history of the East India Company from Persian sources, actually written in Persian, which is fabulous. I mean, it, it, you see the East India Company from the inside. I don't think it's a question of reparation. I think it is a question of recognition though, recognition of what's happened and an understanding that, that what did occur to India um, must not sit underneath the way in which we maintain our current attitudes. So to that extent, it is the same question as recognition of the, the statement from the heart, for example, of at one moment with uh, the first Australians, which is, I think, probably the highest national priority for Australia. If we were to do that, we would radically change our image right around the world. Mm. But anyway, that's the way in which I think we make amends for what happened in India. Would anyone else like to add to that? Or I've got another question here. Just, just very quickly. Um, uh, the Anarchy is a wonderful book. Um, uh, another fantastic book on this topic is, of course, Sashi Tharoor's Inglorious Empire, in which he talks about, as Alan said, the theft and rape, but also uh, the British, uh, the, 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 the imbrication of some of the other curses of modern India, such as the caste system. Uh, which the British uh, deepened and uh, made much more inflexible. Uh, so all of these things, I think, need to be... And it's not only the British, the French, uh, the Spanish, the Portuguese, uh, all have an enormous amount of atonement to make. Mm, all the colonial powers. Um, the next question is from Neeraj Nanda, who says, why is, who asks, why is Australia silent on pressures on democratic and civil liberties inside India? And how can one ignore issues facing minorities uh, and other community, um, vulnerable communities in India? Um, Arti, can I throw that one to you? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, I think Australia absolutely should be more vocal in its support of those minority groups that are currently being oppressed in India. It is caste-based. It is uh, religious. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, whole religions being systematically excluded and denigrated in India. It is community-based. Um, it is, you know, there's, there's this whole issue of, you know, are they Bangladeshis or are they Bengalis? Are they Indian? Are they um, are there people who've just illegally entered India? We're seeing that in the Assam at the moment. I think Australia definitely has a role to play in pushing back against some of those um, uh, issues with civil liberties transgressions. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's political. I think Australia is uh, has too much of an interest in maintaining and um, maintaining and bettering its relationship with India. And it's important to point out that that's kind of from a, a position of being on the back foot. Australia hasn't been in a position of power in its bilateral relationship with India for a very long time. India really has been the one holding, um, you know, holding all the strings. And now it's kind of realised that, oh, it's in our interest to have a good relationship with India. We will return your phone calls. We will come to the table. We will um, decide to, um, you know, bestow the honour of our um, friendship onto you. So Australia is very protective of that. And I don't think it's going to do or say anything to disrupt that, unfortunately. Mm, Alan, we certainly don't see any reticence when it comes to Australia criticising, for example, the human rights record in China, though it seems to me we were ignoring lots of things for, for many, many years. Um, how does Australia pick and choose where it chooses to criticise the human rights records and, and civil problems in, in other countries and, and where it doesn't for people who perhaps aren't au fait with foreign affairs? Look, I think in the way in which we conduct our human rights policies, uh, 
we're very good at getting up on top of the, the, the tub and, and screaming and shouting and pointing the finger and giving lectures and all of that sort of thing. Uh, our own domestic history is not that flash, actually. And we've got lots and lots of things that we should do here and then encourage other countries to do the same because it actually makes for a better country. And, and to my way of thinking, and I've had a lot to do with this matter around caste and structure and so on. And I mean, it is one of the, one of the enormous um, uh, obstacles that India faces to becoming a, a, a really open, great society. I mean, I did my thesis at the ANU on the Manavadam Shastra, which is about essentially the rules for caste. And, and it is a shackle that holds India back. For us, we shouldn't be saying you've got to do X, Y, or Z. What we need to be saying is that what works for us is an open, inclusive society that liberates the talents of everybody in, in our society, no matter where they come from or what their gender is or what their religion is. So instead of pointing at India or pointing at China and saying, you don't do these things properly, we should be saying, the way in which we do it works really well for us. You ought to try it because it might actually work well for you too. Mm. Michael, did you, Michael, did you want to add anything to that? So, so I, I would say that what determines uh, when we speak out about human rights and when we don't is very much to do with our strategic interest. I mean, we were quiet about Indonesia's human rights record uh, all through the Sahado years. Um, at the moment, uh, we're um, saying almost nothing on Myanmar. Uh, and the, the terrible situation that's occurring there. We said almost nothing about what Myanmar did to the Rohingyas uh, when, uh, when that terrible uh, situation was occurring. And we've only just found our voice on what's happening to the Uyghurs um, because suddenly uh, we've, we're at odds with China strategically and we don't see any strategic downside from, start, from starting to uh, criticise them on those human rights issues. So I think... I think we are. Um, I think we're very two-faced, and and we are a, a country that uh, upholds our um, strategic interests more than we care about human rights in other places. Uh, the last question, no, not the last question. We've got a little while yet. Um, Michael Bradley's question is: uh, Australia has quite a long history of misusing educated immigrants for cheap labour. How might we improve this? Um, and surely not only by improving awareness of employment rights. Um, Adi, you touched heavily in your essay on those issues of um, insecure work and, and other things, but that, I guess, is, is a much bigger question. Would you like to kick us off on that one? Oh, look, I feel like this isn't really um, my wheelhouse, but I'll try to, I'll try to answer it. I think... Um, Australia would uh, do well to maybe um, recognise international qualifications and international work experience and have a framework in place where employers, you know, could maybe refer back to, um, um, you know, the government to find out what, you know, what the, um, you know, where that particular qualification sits in reference to Australian qualifications. I think that's really important. Um, I think blind CVs um, are also a really good idea. Um, where, I, I, yeah. wondered, I wondered if I could ask you, just before we came on, uh, we were quickly discussing, um, you know, also the, the shifting goalposts that people find when it comes to applying yeah. for visas and other things like that. Could you tell us a little bit more um, about what that kind of situation that people are facing? Look, um, the people that I've spoken to have said that, you know, they need, they told when they come out here, you need 65 points. That's really hard to get in itself. When they come out here, they satisfy certain, um, you know, they, they, they get those points and they're told, oh, no, now you need 100 points. The goalposts keep shifting. And that's, I've had people contact me since the issues come out saying, thank you for recognising this. This is the absolute hell of my existence, the shifting goalposts. Now I'm told I've got to go out and do more education. And you know, implicit in that is, is that shifting goalpost about creating more opportunities for Australia's education system to milk a bit more money out of, out of students? That is the question they're left with. And they really are felt left with this idea of, you know, are we just cash cows? 
to Australia mm. when they are very serious about wanting to migrate and join our society. Yeah. Michael, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, look, what I would say is it's not it's not my own point, um, but it's a point uh, that was made by Abul Rivsi, um, who uh, is a specialist in kind of migration patterns, that Australia is in effect setting up um, an underclass here, something that uh, that we, uh, you know, as a as an independent federated country, um, you know, one of the main reasons for uh, the white Australia policy was a refusal to countenance the creation of, of an underclass. And as a bull says, you know, this, this migration education nexus is actually setting up a, a, an underclass in Australia. And uh, really the Australian population is not being brought into a proper conversation on what is occurring and what the implications for Australian society will be. Mm. Alan, would you like to add anything? Um, I'm aware of the time, Ebony, and I'm not ashamed to bring in the R word because I think that it, 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 it deep in the Australian psyche is, is racism. And I think that what we're seeing here is just another expression of that. Uh, anecdotally, it is not nearly so difficult for people from Britain or the United States or Canada or New Zealand or anywhere else to come and settle in Australia as it is for people from India. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with a reluctance on the part of bureaucrats to open the place up. I mean, Abul's dad <laughs> was my professor at the ANU, Sayed Atta Abbas Rizvi, and, and, and he brought his family here. That's why Abul and his, uh, and his, his brothers are here and his sister. So th the point I'm making is that th these are fabulous people who come in, but we have got race-based barriers, which I think are an enormous obstacle and are desperately, desperately unjust and unfair. Mm. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I want to thank our panellists, Adi Bedagheri, Professor Michael Wesley and Alan Beam. This is the latest issue of Australian Foreign Affairs. You can pick it up in any good newsagent or bookstore. Uh, and don't forget, uh, there should be a link in the chat uh, that Kate will provide. Uh, there's a discount for Australia Institute supporters. You can order that uh, up until midnight tonight and you might have been sent that in the email invitation that you got for this uh, as well. It's really great. The essays from Artie and from Michael are well worth reading, but so are the others. It's a really good issue. I recommend it to you. Uh, thank you again to the panel for your time today and, and thank you to everyone for all your great questions. As always, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Um, and we had more than 300 people on the line with us today. So thanks very much for your interest. You can join us over the next few weeks for more exciting webinars. Next week, we've got our fortnightly poll position with Guardian Australia and Essential Media. And coming up, uh, we've got a few more exciting webinars on issues relating to the pandemic and inequality. And we're hoping to talk to Chief Minister of the ACT, Andrew Barr, as well. Uh, all those details should be going up shortly on our website. And don't forget uh, to be subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, where we take big economic issues and explain them in plain English. This week, we looked at the Australia Institute's Climate of the Nation report and the changing national attitudes towards climate change in the country. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Thanks so much for your time today. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.